topic today is living in the, the here and now. I've said a million times is that God does not care about your future. It sounds like a harsh statement, but it's true. God does not care about your future because God is not subject to time. Everything to God is here and now. When you, when you talk about your future, did you ever notice that it never gets here? <laughs> because you're always living in the here and now. The future is some far off place we talk about in the future, in the future, but uh, we're always in the here and now. Now, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't plan or be responsible about preparing ourselves for things in life, um, but we have to accept the reality that we're not the ones actually in control of what's to come, but we are in control of here and now. Many of us live under the crushing weight of accumulated yesterdays, or the crushing fear of approaching tomorrows. But for those who have accepted Christ, yesterday is gone and it's cleansed by him. And tomorrow will soon reside in that stack of yesterdays. You can't touch tomorrow and you can't touch yesterday. The only thing we can really interact with is here and now. We can cry over the past, worry about the future, but we can't interact with either of them. And God is relational. He created us to be relational. And to be relational, you have to interact. And to interact, there's only one way to do it. Here and now. Procrastination is one of the absolute most powerful weapons in the adversary's arsenal. And nothing's more expensive than regret. Procrastination is nothing more than the, the executioner of opportunity. So when Jesus said, come to me, he was talking about right now. now. He didn't say, come to me after you've planned everything out uh, and you can, you can get that fit in for tomorrow. He didn't say that. And he didn't say, come to me after you thought about your past and figured out how to get past your baggage and, and come to me after you, you, you work that out. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart. You'll find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Jesus, first of all, he tells us what to do. Come to me, here and now. He tells us what we'll receive as a result. I will give you rest, here and now. He tells us to listen to him. Take my yoke upon you, here and now. He tells us that by doing so, we will understand. Learn from me, here and now. He tells us that we'll, we'll have inner peace. You will find rest for your souls, here and now. And he concludes with telling us that God's way is the way of love, not the way of legalism. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. A lot of people say they wonder what that means in the Bible. I'm asked that a lot. Why did Jesus say say that his burden his yoke is easy and his burdens light they hated him they rejected him they crucified him what's he mean by that well first of all he's not talking about that he's not talking about his crucifixion a yoke is something you put on an ox or a steer or a cow to pull most of us know what that is you put it around its neck and shoulders and it pulls the plow forward so when you take someone's yoke upon you that's who you serve so you're doing their will so when you serve Jesus, you're taking his yoke upon you. So what he's talking about when he says, when, when he says his yoke is easy, he means the, because the yoke of the church, the leadership, what they're putting on you, that legalism, you got to donate this much. You got to say this many prayers. You can only dress this way. You better make this sacrifice to the temple or you're going to stand in our judgment. Jesus' yoke is easy. You don't worry about all that. Here's what I'm telling you to do. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Do unto others as you would do unto yourself. He, what he's telling you is, is everything he's offering you is good. You know, the yoke he is putting on you is one of love and one of compassion. Not a bunch of rules to follow, so you're going to get in trouble by these guys. Don't worry about that. That's legalism. The heart of God is what I am putting on you to follow. That's why he says my yoke is easy. Because it's the way of God. And that's what he's talking about. My burden is, is light. He only asks that we seek and love God with all our hearts. The burden is the responsibilities put on us. He's not asking for endless sacrifices and the observation of ritualistic ceremonies. He's asking us to obey God's rules of love, compassion, loving God. And the big one is repentance. Those are the, that's the yoke and the burden he puts on us. 
That's, that's what you want to think about in your heart. That's what you want to do. You follow Jesus and those are his rules. So that's what he means when Jesus says his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Everything Jesus ever said should be taken as urgent. Every single thing. What made his word so urgent wasn't the way he said it. Jesus wasn't pushy. He didn't say, come on, man, hurry up, do this. Hurry, hurry, hurry. He wasn't, it wasn't pushy. Instead, it was the weight of his words. That, carry, that carries the urgency. An example is when Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In Matthew 4, 17, from that time Jesus began to preach and say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Your hand's right here. Your hand never gets any further away from you than this. Your hand is here and now. We know from reading the Bible that Jesus was not saying, the end of the world's coming any minute now. He was conveying the idea to us that all time is here and now. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's something Jesus is trying to get the idea across. You deal with yourself here and now about this. Because at hand is always here. Faith is the opposite of, of uh, worry. When you, when you live in faith, you can remove worry from your entire thought life. Jesus prompts us to be urgent about the present. He gives a stern but a, a comforting message about worry. Luke 12, 22 through 24. Then Jesus said to the disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat, about your body, what you'll wear. Life is more than food. The body is more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They don't sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn. Yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you than birds? Being intentional is something to keep so present in your thoughts. It should be the first thing, the, the, the first thing you think about when your feet hit the floor in the morning. What can I do to honor God? What can I do to honor my fellow man? What can, how can I make life better for somebody? Which is loosely translated, how can I make my own life better? Because that's what it does. And I promise you, I promise you, it will happen. If you put God first with a sense of urgency, there will be a noticeable, a noticeable difference in the quality of your own life. There was a world-renowned doctor in the late 19th, early 20th century. His name's Sir William Osler. And he used this phrase. He said that we should live, quote, live in day-tight compartments. A day-tight compartment. And he used that phrase a lot. And he got it from, it was penned, it was written from a line by another guy named Thomas Carlyle. And he wrote this, quote, Our main business is not to see what lies dimly in the distance, but to do what lies clearly at hand. Start thinking about that when Jesus said, kingdom of heaven is at hand. That reminds me of that other illustration. Somebody told me there's a fence between heaven and hell. A guy sitting on the fence trying to figure out what he wants to do with his life. And Satan comes out and says, hey, man, you made a decision about where you're going to go yet? And the guy sat there on the fence and he said, I haven't decided yet. And Satan says, yeah, yeah, you decided. I own that fence. Ah, wow. That's a, <laughs> that's a pretty powerful statement, isn't it? He does. He owns the fence. If you're sitting on the fence... You've, you've, you've chosen a side. You've chosen a side. And I'm not just talking about people who don't come to Christ. I'm not talking about people who just need saved. I'm talking about Christians too. I'm talking about things we do, things we say, things we do in our lives. I know we're forgiven. I know we have salvation. I know Jesus died for us. So I know we're heaven bound. But we do, we, we're still confronted with things every day. We're like, man, I got I, I to gotta quit doing that or I got to quit thinking that way. It's, it's, it's a relevant message to be intentional about seeking God, living in the here and now. We, have, we only have to remember we only get so much time. We only get so much, none of us know how much time we have. There's three principles we, we don't think about that maybe we need to be reminded about to keep in mind when we decide how to be intentional. First of all, never leave anything half finished. Otherwise, it stands a greater chance of becoming never finished. Uh, like a lot of fathers do that. Many of us in this room have experienced that, you know, about their their their, their children. They they don't raise their kids. They walk out of their lives. You, know, you don't you don't need to finish raising that child, but there's going to be a sign on that kid for the rest of his life that says not finished, and you're the one who hung it there. So how we cultivate relationships with people this pertains to that too. Never leave never leave anything half finished. Choose your priorities at the beginning of the day carefully. We don't have time to do everything. So we have to choose what really matters. And the last one we've all heard a million times, never close out the day with a quarrel that's unresolved. Otherwise, you stand a greater chance of never resolving it. And that's biblical. That's right out of Ephesians. 
In your anger, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Now, I know that anger and irritation does show up. It usually shows up when things aren't going how we want them to, which incidentally, anger is a secondary emotion. Anger is an emotion that arrives out of selfishness. It always comes out of selfishness because you don't get what you want, so you get mad. You, you think that sounds silly, but if you think it through when somebody cuts you off in traffic, why are you angry? Because they're where you want to be. I should be there, not him. I should be in line there, not you. You should be behind me. Anger always comes from selfishness. It does. It just does. Hey, Pastor, it's nice, to, <laughs> it's nice to think I can plan out my day, but that's not how real life works. Things happen that are out of my control. Everything doesn't always go as planned. It's nice for you to say that in a sermon, but that's not the real world. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a real good point. You know what the golden rule is of the here and now? Is interruption. Interruption should be expected. I cannot guarantee you when I make plans, I made a lot of plans this week, but I can guarantee you one thing, that I will get interrupted. I can't tell you, I promise you this is going to go this way, but I can promise you I'm going to get interrupted. Instead of looking at that as an inconvenience or an excuse, why not to deal with the here and now, make it the golden rule that goes above everything, because it is. You ever heard someone say, if you want to hear God laugh, tell him your plans? There's a lot, there's a, there, there's a lot of truth to that. Or, or, or life is what happens while you're making other plans. That's true too. You can count on interruptions. That's always going to happen with well laid out plans. It, it's happened in the history of the... But Satan's interrupted man's walk with God. God interrupted Satan's efforts and destroyed them with a divine plan. Jesus interrupted man's misunderstandings of God's laws. Although divinely ordained, all of these events would have been perceived as interruptions at the time they occurred. So many interruptions we have are divine appointments. Jesus was interrupted when he was speaking. Man was lowered down from the roof to be healed in Luke 5, 17. Jesus turned an interruption into a life-changing event. Moses was interrupted by Pharaoh's army, taking everyone out of Egypt. God birthed an earth-shaking miracle in that interruption. Mary's engagement plans were interrupted. She was put in the shadows of shame by the people around her. God brought the Savior of all mankind into the world through that interruption. So interruptions are going to be there. You can embrace them because they can be opportunities to strengthen your ability to live in the here and now. If you want to avoid frustration and irritation, you better count on the interruptions because they're coming. The truth and interruptions have one thing in common. They all show up to the parties they weren't invited to. They show up to every party they're not invited to. Interruptions and the truth. And those are two very powerful principles. If you have to decide to respond to Jesus as your personal Savior, do it now. Here and now. Get off the fence because we know who owns the fence. If you need to make a decision about the direction of the rest of your entire existence, not your life here, your existence, do it now. Procrastination's the thief. It's the executioner of opportunity. The road to later leads to the city of never. There's no more sobering truth than that. I'm going to say it again. The road to later leads to the city of never. That is the easiest thing to understand that we could say about procrastination. Isn't it? I'm not talking about putting off mowing your lawn. I'm not talking about putting off going to the grocery store. I know we put that stuff off. But that's, that's not involving your eternal existence, though. Your eternal existence should be at the top of the priority list.